Okay, so from now on, it's being recorded. Okay, guys, so welcome to another webinar with Ivana. And yeah, today, let's jump right away into our subject of handling emotions on the fasting lifestyle. So Ivana, over to you. Right, so today um, I'm going to talk about tapping and how to use it for emotional and physical healing. Uh, and I think that I'm going to carry on with some of the discussion that um, I started last week. But uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who expressed their support after the last webinar. You know, your kind words meant a lot to me. It was kind of a big deal for me to put my stuff out there. And um, I agonized about it going back and forth and whether or not I should actually air my family history publicly, uh, which wasn't so much about being afraid uh, of people knowing, but because people who are in my life and even like clients, uh, they know about it. So it's not a secret. But what I realized afterwards was that um, what I was actually afraid of was that if I put it out there on YouTube, then uh, my parents would find out about my act of betrayal, essentially. Because in shame-based families, you must be unquestionably loyal and protect the family secrets at all costs. So coming out in such a public way was basically the ultimate act of defiance and betrayal. And I also realized that by keeping it all in for such a long time, in one way I was actually protecting my parents from public scrutiny and therefore shame. But the other aspect of this was that on an unconscious level, I also feared retribution to some extent because to my inner child, my parents are really scary people. But I did it and guess what? I wasn't struck by lightning, nor did the world come to an end. And I think that's why it's so important to talk about our toxic shame and the things that we are so ashamed of. You know, for a very long time, I was extremely ashamed of the fact that I was abused. Why? Because my parents told me that I made them do it. If only I were normal, like other kids, then they wouldn't have to beat me. If I were a good kid, then there would be no reason to punish me. And so the beatings were simply an attempt at fixing me and setting me straight. So, you know, as a kid, you're being brainwashed and, and you hear that. And if it's not bad enough that you're beating, be, being beaten, then you think to yourself, boy, now I really feel like shit. It's all my fault. But aside from that, there's also something so crushingly humiliating about being physically abused. I remember my dad uh, talking with, you know, such disgust about men who, who beat their wives because as a man, well, you should never hit a woman. And yet there he was beating a little girl into a pulp on a regular basis for sport. So how is it that it's not acceptable to hit your wife because she's a woman, but somehow it's considered good parenting for an adult man to beat a female child with all the strength that he's got. I mean, what kind of backwards logic is that? And that was why my internalized toxic shame was even more magnified. I used to go to great lengths to hide the abuse from teachers, friends, and extended family. And hiding this shame became a survival mechanism of itself. If it came out, how badly I was abused, then everyone would know 
why I was being abused. And of course, I had to be beaten because I was unforgivably defective. So I feared that exposing that rotten core would have catastrophic consequences, meaning no one would ever love me or want me if they knew what a degenerate I really was. And at the time that seemed like a plausible explanation because if you're so bad that even your own parents can't love you, then how could anyone else love you? And so toxic shame is therefore a threat to our own survival. And so when we become addicts to cope with that shame, then we further compound the original shame by being ashamed of our addiction. So what finally happens when we come out of the closet and show our shame to the world is that we discover much to our surprise that instead of shunning or judging us, people are actually very compassionate and accepting because we're not unique and most people have experienced some degree of pain and can relate and be empathetic to our suffering. So what such coming out does for us is disrupt that programming that tells us that being exposed equals to never being accepted or loved. It blows up that belief uh, that we must continue to hide. And all of a sudden you realize that the very thing that you were so afraid of is actually not a big deal. And this is something that happened for me actually within just the last week because it created a big shift even in that short period of time. You know, I help clients with emotional healing all the time. And what I see is that they're very embarrassed to talk about their problems because they falsely believe that they are the most screwed up person on the face of the planet and that no one else has problems as bad as they do. But when someone tells me about their problems, I'm not thinking, oh my God, what a mess you are. You know, instead of, I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm so sorry that you had to live through that much pain. And yet for some reason, I would apply a different standard to myself, beating myself up for my many failings. Well, that reason is not just some arbitrary reason. The universal reason is always a lack of love, self-love. The reason is that we don't believe that we are deserving of compassion and forgiveness. But once we decide to move past that fear and our mind finally faces what it believes to be a certain death, essentially, when those fears don't materialize and we survive this dreaded exposure of our shame, then the mind can then collapse those false beliefs, no longer viewing our shameful experience as an existential threat. And that alone can actually be enough to break us out of our addiction because addictions serve only one purpose. And that is to protect the secret of who we secretly believe ourselves to be, which is worthless and defective. In essence, what exposing our shame does is it shows us that our worst fears aren't actually real. You know that saying, don't believe everything you think? Well, I find that it's 100% true because the mind creates a false narrative and then uses it as a guiding principle for all of our decisions. And the big reason we continue to be affected by trauma is that 
we basically believe everything that's in our head. So we carry these painful memories of past events and believe them to be real. But memories are not real. They're not actual events. They are mental constructs. The original event was real when it happened, when someone hurt us. But once that event is over, then the trauma is finished. And the problem is created when we transcribe our version of that event into our brain and then keep revisiting it. And so every time we access that memory, we re-traumatize ourselves. Except this time, it's not our abuser that's doing it to us. It is us doing it to ourselves. Which, of course, is madness unless you enjoy suffering. And this, of course, is the difference between having emotional intelligence and not having it. You see, emotionally intelligent people don't continuously pick at old scabs or rehash old events. So when we hold grudges and resentments, preserving those past hurts, we are only hurting ourselves. This means that to a large extent, we, we ourselves are the source of our own suffering. Yes, it is true that mom and dad beat me, but they aren't doing it anymore. Yet, for some reason, I continue to act as if the abuse was ongoing. But why would I do that? Am I stupid or self-destructive? Or maybe I'm just a masochist? Well, the pro problem lies in our definitions. And the reason we often can't help uh, ourselves and can't let go of these painful memories and continue to sabotage our physical and emotional healing is that we are actually invested in those negative memories. Remember when last week I talked about the motivational payoff mechanism and how we don't do anything unless we believe that it's for some good reason. For example, for a very long time, I resisted letting go of my animosity towards my parents and was holding on to the past experiences of abuse, even though rationally, I knew that what I was doing was hurting me and causing me problems. But I prefer doing that to forgiving and letting go. Why? Because I felt that if I forgave them, then I would be letting them off the hook, essentially absolving them. And they would get to get away with a crime, which in my mind was grossly unfair. So I thought to myself, nope, you assholes don't get to get away with hurting me. You don't get to just move on and, you know, go on your merry way, living happily ever after while I'm left here picking up the pieces. So as you can see, I had created a definition wherein there was a payoff for me to keep these horrible experiences of abuse alive. I wanted to punish my parents more than I wanted to get well. So I kept myself stuck. So another reason we may hold on to the traumatic memories is um, this convoluted way to punish our abusers. You see, if I stayed screwed up, then I could continue, you know, to, to, to guilt my dad for beating me. Oh, you have a problem with me being an alcoholic? Well, you're the one who did it to me. So don't you come here shaming me for my dysfunctional life because this is your fault. Therefore, you are the one who should feel shamed. And that's just another way that we may try to throw that shame, that original shame that our abusers projected onto us back at them. Of course, in the end, the only person I was punishing was myself. Reliving the abuse in my mind wasn't hurting my parents. 
they don't know or care how I'm being affected by their past actions. So I kept recreating that pain because I was deriving some perverse sense of righteousness from it. And in that way, my martyrdom served a justifiable purpose. Now, people will also hold on to pain and especially the chronic type of physical pain for the same exact reason. For example, if in childhood, uh, when you were sick, you got lots of attention, then you're going to associate pain with love. Some people, when they were sick, didn't have to do homework or chores. So now they may keep it uh, going because then others cannot have expectations of them to perform. For example, like being on time or doing their job at work. You see, if you don't perform at work out of laziness or shirking your responsibilities, then you get fired. But if you can make, you know, if you cannot make an important presentation because you're having a flare up uh, in your debilitating health condition, then instead of being mad, people will feel bad for you. They're going to feel sorry because, well, it's not your fault. You can't control this awful disease. So everyone is just going to work around it and pull together and pick up your slack. And I worked with someone like that for more than a decade. Uh, someone who was constantly ill with a mysterious, unidentifiable illness. She was also incompetent and lazy. So when things got stressful, when we had to you know, plow through a lot of work, she would all of a sudden go blind in one eye and come down when, with nondescript pains that would lay her out for two weeks. Now, I'm not saying that this person was necessarily faking it or lying, but that her mind would actually create pain in her body to avoid what she perceived as a greater threat. So even excruciating pain can serve a purpose and become a coping mechanism. For some people, being sick equals free money. If they're too ill to work, they can go on disability where they will get a monthly check uh, from the government for a certain amount. And that amount is guaranteed and provides a sense of security. Now, if they were to get well, that money goes away. And then they have to get a job and take responsibility for their life. But if you feel worthless and incapable because you've been brainwashed that you're stupid uh, and you can't do anything right, then that prospect is very scary for you because you're going to fear that you might not be able to get a good enough job to pay your bills and therefore survive. And so again, it's safer to stay ill. Now, people may say that they want to get rid of their problem, but if secretly that problem is a source of comfort, then they will keep recreating it. And this is why it's so important to examine our motivations uh, behind these destructive behaviors that we know are harming us, yet we continue them. When we discussed cravings during one of the webinars in the past, um, I remember Revitat saying that she craved certain foods because they reminded her of her grandmother. And they also reminded her of the feeling of safety and coziness that she experienced as a child. So she created a link between the food and her grandmother. And many people do the same. They have come to associate food with mom, dad, or grandma. And the affection that those key uh, figures provided. But now that grandma is no longer around, whenever Revital feels lonely, stressed, or scared, she may automatically create a link to that good feeling. But since she can no longer speak with her grandma, the next best thing is the food that she has emotionally linked with the grandmother. 
So another big reason people can't let go of their attachment to food is that they associate it with certain people and relationships. Because letting go of that food automatically equals to letting go of grandma or of mom or dad. And that would be perceived as a loss. So to successfully tap the food addiction out, we have to collapse the feel-good emotions connected to it. Because you see, food is not love. Not only that, but if we truly did love ourselves, we wouldn't eat foods that we know are bad for us because harming our body is not an act of love. Now, I wanna also go a bit deeper into how we adopt eating as a coping mechanism to help us avoid our toxic shame. Last week, I talked about um, how the mind creates links between behaviors like eating and feeling loved and safe. But this is a two-way mechanism or you know, more appropriately, a double-edged sword. And at the time I gave an example of dad uh, taking his child out for pizza after beating her uh, so that he could you know, assuage his guilt and try to make up for what he did. And as a result, the child makes an emotional connection between love and pizza. But that doesn't end there because the child also links the beating and the shaming to pizza as well. So now when you feel attacked, when you feel unsafe and you get triggered, it's gonna stimulate the craving for pizza as a way to avoid dealing with negative emotions. But when you give in to the craving and eat that pizza, pizza in itself becomes a secondary trigger because it simultaneously reactivates the memory of the beating, which in turn then reactivates the primary trigger, making you want more pizza to alleviate now this additional anxiety brought on as a result of eating that first slice of pizza. I don't know if you can follow me. I'm, I'm sort of having trouble following myself a little bit. So now you're going to find yourself in a binge cycle because instead of alleviating your anxiety, eating actually reinforces it, where you keep eating and finding no relief. So as you can see from this example, the coping mechanism for a trigger, which in this case is pizza, becomes an emotional trigger itself. And of course, this doesn't have to be pizza. This could be cake, chocolate, lasagna, or whatever else your preference is. Now, part of the reason why it's so difficult to overcome a food addiction is that standard therapeutic approach to addiction is to avoid triggers, which may work with drugs and even alcohol to some extent, but what are you gonna do about food? You can't avoid it, you have to eat, which means that you're going to be triggered every time you go to the supermarket or whenever someone at the office orders pizza for lunch. The smell inside of which is going to trigger that memory of the beating and then activate your fight or flight response, putting you into a trance wherein you're incapable of making rational decisions. And since behavior modification isn't an effective treatment for addiction, we have to reframe the original traumatic event that triggers us. And this can be done effectively through tapping. Now, when you start working on yourself or on your clients, you may discover conflicting beliefs and emotions when it comes to uh, addictions. Let's say you have a client who says that she no longer wants to be triggered by pizza. So we say, okay, we're going to break that emotional connection you created with food by taking away those comforting, soothing, and loving feelings of fulfillment you feel when you eat it. And from that point on, anytime you smell or look at pizza, you're going to feel nothing. And you know what happens a lot of the times? People walk, they go, 
well, hold on now. I don't want you to ruin pizza for me forever. I still want to be able to enjoy it, you know, from time to time. You see, when you have unresolved emotional pain and no healthy coping skills, you're going to be afraid to let go of the only coping mechanism that has worked. Of course, it doesn't work very well because it's only temporary and it does have negative repercussions. But for a brief moment, it does snap you out of pain and that perceived danger. So what the client is thinking is that what if something bad happens and I get overwhelmed? How will I survive without this coping mechanism? Because a coping mechanism is essentially a survival tactic. So the client is thinking that if they let it go, then the next time something bad happens or they get triggered, how will they get through it? So the subconscious mind does the cost to benefit analysis and decide that it's actually better to keep the emotional eating in place than to let it go. Because much worse things can happen than sabotaging fasting or detox. So as destructive as they may be, in a way, our negative programs love us and keep us safe, which of course makes it harder for us to let them go. This means that unless a person decides to truly disengage from the negative memories, triggers associated with these memories and the unhealthy coping mechanisms that were adopted to, uh, in a sense, be able to perpetuate them, then no therapy, including tapping, is going to work. And they may say, you know, this just doesn't work. Or they may believe that they're not like other people, that they're special, in, in a sense, that they're more screwed up or that their problems are so difficult and complicated that they're just beyond help. And it's, of course, just another coping mechanism to keep you away from getting well. Now, while it is important to uncover how we create our problems, focusing too much on why we're screwed up can actually be counterproductive in that it can serve as a way to justify the problem being there and may then be used to absolve us of responsibility. For example, a person can say, see, it's not my fault that I'm an alcoholic and I can't hold down a job. I have an addiction because of somebody else who hurt me. Or it's a disease that's out of my control and therefore I cannot change it. So this type of thinking can continue to reinforce a person's sense of victimhood and helplessness by creating a valid excuse to keep having the problem rather than changing it. So the bottom line is that the only reason we have a problem is that we keep recreating it over and over again by maintaining an emotional connection to the memory of the original trauma. And as long as we keep that memory alive, we're going to respond to life from that place of negativity, fear, and helplessness. Now, emotional freedom technique, also known as tapping, is an incredibly powerful tool that can help us uh, moderate our emotions and bodily reactions. It works by engaging specific meridians or energy pathways that have a direct impact on the nervous system. Now, there are different tapping techniques and I'm going to discuss the classic EFT model as well as something that's called the faster EFT. But first I wanna talk about how this actually works and why it works. There are 14 major meridians transecting both the physical and energetic bodies. Most classic sequences utilize 10 acupuncture points and sometimes less depending on the, the people that you follow. Now, if there are 14 meridians, then why are we only using 10 points? Well, it's because some points intersect multiple meridians and you can impact two meridians at once while engaging a single point. So 
I already talked about this and Jordan discussed it in her videos. You have the side of the hand, also known as the karate chop. And this corresponds with the small intestine. Uh, then we have the corner of the eye. We have the eyebrow. We have under the eye. We have under the nose, uh, the chin point. Then we have the collarbone which is the kidneys, then the side of the torso, right under the arm on the rib cage. And uh, there's the liver point, which is right underneath the breast. And then we have the wrist point. And the wrist is a double point. We have to engage the front and the back of it. So, the emotional freedom technique gives us the ability to either scale down negative feelings or physical sensations like hunger and pain, thus reducing their intensity. Or it can actually allow us to eliminate these sensations and feelings completely. So tapping is sort of a physiological way of reassuring the mind that we are safe. It calms the limbic system, which drives fear, hunger, uh, pleasure, and anger by sending a signal to the nervous system that everything is okay, that there is no real danger or trauma in the present moment. It's like when you have an animal, a dog or a cat, that gets uh, startled by a loud noise and they become very tense and, and sort of afraid. But as you start to pet the animal gently while comforting it in a soothing voice, it will relax and return to feeling calm. So by tapping, we're breaking the conditioned trauma response much in the same way. And we are reducing or eliminating the emotional arousal by sending a calming signal to our amygdala. And this literally physiologically lowers our cortisol levels in the body by pulling us out of that fight or flight mode. EFT can also be used as a shortcut when you would like to give yourself an instant boost of energy or, or focus or even happiness. And the best part about it is that it's fairly quick and it gets you to feeling good and back on track, sometimes in, in a matter of minutes. Now, tapping on the meridians also allows for the energy to be processed out of our energy body and the nervous system. And so each point is also connected to specific emotional states. Now, I'm going to read these out to you so that I don't forget anything. So, for example, the eyebrow point relates, releases trauma, hurt, sadness, restlessness, impatience, frustration, and dread. And when stimulated, it allows inner peace and emotional healing. The side of the eye point releases rage, anger, resentment, fear of change, and muddled thinking, thus allowing for more clarity, compassion, and understanding. The under eye point releases fear, anxiety, worry, emptiness, nervousness, and disappointment, thus making room for contentment, calmness, and feeling safe. The point under the nose releases embarrassment, shame, guilt, grief, fear of ridicule, powerlessness, and fear of failure. And instead, it allows self-empowerment, self-acceptance, and compassion. The chin point releases confusion, uncertainty, embarrassment, shame, and second guessing, bringing in certainty, clarity, self-confidence, and self-acceptance. The collarbone removes worry and decision, feeling stuck, and general stress. Stimulating it allows for ease in moving forward as well as confidence and clarity. Underarm point releases guilt, obsessiveness, worry, hopelessness, insecurity, and poor self-esteem. 
replacing them with clarity, confidence, relaxation, and compassion for self and others. You see, what we perceive as these problematic states that are triggered by past trauma or unresolved issues is actually a type of hypnotic trance or a trance that was established as a defense mechanism at the time the original trauma occurred. When we are triggered, we're essentially not here. We are in a mentally constructed scenario that isn't real and we are no longer in our body. When fight or flight gets triggered, we have a number of defense mechanisms that can go into effect. We can either flee, fight, or freeze. And tapping breaks us out of that hypnotic trance and enables us to instill a new and different state of being. And of course, what we're usually aiming for is peace. So with each tap, we can let go of this uncomfortable feeling as we focus on the sensations in the body. And once the negative feelings have been discharged, then the final step is to replace them with positive affirmations in order to instill a peaceful state of mind by anchoring this new preferred state through tapping on the meridians. Because when we're feeling peace, we are in the present moment. Whereas a trance state, by definition, takes us out of the present, causing us to re-experience the original traumatic event. And if we're making decisions from the trance state, we're making decisions out of fear. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the decisions that are made from that state of fear are going to be poor and often detrimental, like polishing off an entire chocolate cake or getting high or losing a bunch of money gambling or maxing out your credit card buying things that you don't need. But if we're at peace, then we can make choices that are healthy and constructive. Now, regardless of what emotional or physical state you want to regulate, the classic tapping method employs a recipe or a formula, if you will. If you will. And how tapping works is that first, we uh, bring the uncomfortable emotions to the surface and we amplify them. We amplify them to their full volume while tapping on these power points. It's imperative that we identify and feel these emotions fully instead of avoiding or suppressing them. Because we cannot change a problem if we don't realize that there is a problem. And how do we know that we have this problem? Well, we feel something, right? Usually it's some sort of feeling of discomfort or discontent. And it is only when we allow ourselves to experience these feelings fully we can begin to release them. Now, generally this formula goes something like this. First, we identify a negative emotional state, feeling or a bodily sensation that we would like to shift. And then we sort of gauge the intensity of this feeling on the scale from one to 10. The next thing we do is create what's called the problem affirmation or the problem phrase, which describes the issue that we're dealing with. So we would start out by saying something like this as we're tapping on the side of the hand. Even though I am tired or anxious or in pain or whatever, I deeply and profoundly love and accept myself. Now, the main emphasis here should be on the negative part of the statement. Uh, and then this problem phrase gets repeated three times before we start tapping on all the other points. Now, once the circuit is completed, we check back with our feelings and sensations to assess if the problem that we were tapping on is gone or if we have reduced the intensity of it to a low enough degree on the scale from one to 10. If we have not, we get back to tapping until we reduce it further. And once the problem is gone, then we bring in positive affirmations to make us feel good. 
Now, if you are like me and you've watched a bunch of videos on YouTube that describe tapping or, or you listen to these meditations, then you may be confused because it seems like a lot. It's too involved. And, you know, there are differences in how different people do this. And most people avoid tapping because they think that it's too complicated and they're worried that they're not going to get the affirmations right or the sequence correctly. And they think that this is going to undermine the efficacy of tapping or even worse that their imperfect implementation can actually beget the opposite result. The main source of confusion is that there's a great deal of variation and consistency, as I already said. Uh, so people wonder who's doing it right. What's the right way to do this? For example, some practitioners would start with the head point, others with the eyebrows. Some utilize the head point, some don't utilize it at all. So I used to be confused about this as well. But the good thing is, is that it's not really important. Even the phrasing or the words you use is really not of any consequence. Now, a lot of people have a problem saying to themselves the phrase, even though blank, I fully love and accept myself because they don't feel that way. They don't love themselves. They cannot actually say that to themselves. Or when they say it, it sounds fake, phony. So it's hard for them to, to take the exercise seriously. And some people are actually afraid that repeating negative things and focusing on the problem is actually going to strengthen and hardwire those feelings into their brain. But this is not the case and you don't need to worry about any of that because there's quite a bit of freedom in the application of the emotional freedom technique. And it's almost impossible to get tapping wrong. You don't have to phrase things in a specific way or tap on the points in a specific sequence. The most important thing is that you identify the feelings and the sensations that it produces in the body and then you tap it out. Now, as soon as the uncomfortable feeling or emotion comes up, the first thing you wanna do is locate it in your body and get in touch with the sensation, this physical sensation it actually produces. Are you feeling tightness in your chest? Is your throat feeling restricted? Are you having difficulty breathing? Is your heartbeat irregular? That sort of thing. Tune in to what you're feeling and where you're feeling it. You need to know this to be able to then tell whether or not it's gone, right? So you don't even need to know where this feeling or sensation is coming from or who or what triggered it. You don't even need to identify the emotion that you're experiencing. It doesn't matter if it's fear or sadness or anxiety, that's irrelevant. The most important thing is to identify the feeling and feel its full impact. And once you've gotten a hold of that feeling, then you start tapping. Now, I mostly use now the faster EFT method, which was developed by Robert Smith because it combines uh, tapping with NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And it is a much more condensed and streamlined process that is also extremely powerful. And it utilizes only five points. Uh, the eyebrow, side of the eye, under the eye, collarbone, and then the wrist. And all you have to do is tap on them and say, I'm letting it go. I let it go now. It's okay for me to let it go. It's safe for me to let it go. You grab your wrist. You inhale, you exhale, and you say to yourself, peace. It's very, very simple. Now, understand that anytime we are accessing a memory, we enter an altered state of consciousness. When we are daydreaming, when we are thinking back to what happened, we are actually in a trance. 
So when we connect with negative memories, we enter what we call the bad trance. And the reason we're doing this to begin with is that we want to activate the part of the brain where this memory is stored so that we can tap it out. But once you get in touch with that memory or feeling, you don't want to stay there because holding the trance while connected to that memory will only drive you deeper into the negative state. So when we tap, we access the memory and the part of the brain where it is stored, but then we break the trance and tap on letting it go. So first we want to remove it from the part of the brain where it's been imprinted. And then we're going to access a good memory, which puts us in a good trance and then we borrow the emotional content of that memory and transcribe it in the place of the bad memory that we just removed or changed. So the order of things is essentially this. We access the memory, we go into bad trance, we step out of the trance, we tap it out, then we check back to see if we can bring it back. If you can bring the feeling or the emotion back or the sensation back, then you have to get back to tapping. Once we have tapped it out, we are no longer triggered by it. Then we go into the good trance by accessing a good memory, a good feeling and sensation. And then we tap it in sort of to, to hardwire it in. Now recreating memories or changing memories, rewriting memories is essential. Because for something to be uh, transcribed into our brain, it has to have emotional charge behind it. You see, it's not enough to think positive things if you don't emotionally connect with them. In that case, they're just not going to take. So we're essentially borrowing the feelings from good memories to charge the new changed memory that we're trying to implant as a replacement for the traumatic one. I generally divide tapping uh, procedure into tapping out and tapping in. When we are releasing negative stuff, we tap it out. When we are hardwiring new good stuff into our brain, then we are tapping in. Now, our brain's library is biased. It is heavily skewed towards the negative. Uh, we tend to hold on to negative feelings because we want to use those experiences as a warning to keep us from repeating them again. The problem is that the more we focus on the negative aspects, the more we perpetuate them and the more we will continue to recreate them. So this mechanism of keeping the negative trauma as a teaching moment, to, as a defense mechanism, is actually counterproductive because it begets us the opposite of what our intention is when we're filing it away uh, as a reference point. So the mind automatically stores and saves negative memories as a reference of what to be on the lookout for or what to avoid in the future. Whereas our good and happy memories, those great things that happen to us, they pose no threat. So we're less likely to actually hardwire them into the brain. So what I started doing is that when something really, really great happens to me, then I take a few moments to tap that in because I want to sort of burn that memory and imprint it into my brain so that there is a surplus of good memories in my mind as opposed to the bad stuff. So the process is geared toward getting rid of the bad memories and replacing them with good ones and also continuously bringing in and building up the database of memories with more good stuff. So anytime, you know, I lent a great client and I had a great session and things just were flowing and it was great. Afterwards, I'll go, I'm really good at my job. People respond well to me. 
I know what I'm doing. I am competent. You understand? Because this is something that is essential that we do for our self-esteem and sense of self-worth, especially if we are shame-based people, if we were raised to believe that we're stupid, that we're worthless, and so on. So in, the, in essence, we're using the same mechanism that stores trauma, except we're flipping it around and then transcribing positive information instead. So I hope that this was clear enough, but I want you to guys, I want you to ask questions and maybe we can practice a little bit. Maybe you want to, you know, bring stuff up that, that is bothering you and we can work through this so that we can see in practical terms what this is like. Anyone? Hello, my name is Aranka. I'm a Hungarian. Hi, and I watched your other Zooms with uh, keen attention and really enjoyed them and took quite a bit home with me to okay. my heart. Thank you for your generous, this is very, super generous. Like, um, wow. My question is, um, was on the group is how much, how strong uh, should I do this tapping? How, 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 what's the impact? Uh, what's the physical very impact? light, very light. You, you don't want to beat yourself up. It's very light. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, the other people were saying that um, until, uh, until the symptom goes away. But for example, right now I'm experiencing strong vertigos. It started with my dry fast of three days. Uh -huh. And a very strong vertigo is taking over me. Okay. All right. So let's do this. How strong on a scale from one to 10? So uh, in the last, it started last Tuesday. So it was so, so much so that I had to crawl. Um, well, we're talking right now in this moment. If, right you, now, if you were to give it a number from zero to 10, what would it five, be? Five. Five. All right. So you know what that feels like. All right. So now you start tapping. I'm letting it go and just say, I'm letting it go. I am letting it go. Side of the eye, it's okay for me to let it go. Go to the side of the eye, it's okay for me it's to okay let it go. It's okay for me to let it go. It's bringing tears. Good, good. Okay, what, 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 when tears are coming, what, what are you thinking about? I don't know. That's okay. So, all right, so we're letting the tears go under the eye. It's okay for me to have these feelings and emotions. It's There's okay nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with that. I am letting them go. I guess scaredness. I, I am scared. Here? Okay, that's okay. Just, I want you to not stay in there. I want you to focus more on your fingertips and where you're tapping instead of staying in the feeling. Now you're going to go to your collarbone. I release all resistance. I release all resistance. Allowing myself to let this go fully and completely. Allow myself to let it go completely. Now you're going to grab your wrist. <clears throat> I'm physically experiencing. Okay, all right. Squeeze. Inhale, deep breath in. Exhale. And say peace to yourself. Peace. All right, now I want you to check back in. How are you feeling? Is it still there? No, down to two. It's still there, but it's down, down to two. two. Okay, so we go back. I'm feeling better now. I'm feeling better now. As I continue to release this sensation from my body. As I continue to release this sensation from my body. Side of the eye. It's easy for me to let it go. It's easy for me to let it go. It no longer serves a purpose. It no longer serves a purpose. So I let it go with ease. So I let it go with ease. With no problems and no resistance. With no problems and no resistance. Collarbone. It's so <laughs> easy to let this go. 
I'm sorry, what did you say? It's so easy to let this go. It is so easy to let it go. Wrist again, squeeze the wrist. Inhale, inhale, deep, deep, deep long breath in. Exhale and say peace. Peace. Now, how are you feeling? Where are you now? No vertigo, wonderful. All right, but try, let's just to, you know, play the devil's advocate. Let's try to bring it back. See if you can I bring it back. Okay. Yes. All right, we wanna make sure that it's really gone. See if, if it's still there at all. Alexa, off. Alexa, music off. I'm sorry, my Alexa was on. <laughs> okay, so yeah. how was it getting up? Was it still there, anything left? No. There's no, 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 no vertigo. And yet, uh, just when I joined the Zoom, I was not able to stay up. All right, perfect. An unsettling effect, right? Okay. So now, before we go back in, I want you to go back into your memory database and remember the time where you felt strong, you felt good, you felt joyful. Can you access a memory like that? Yes, when I help other people with raw perfect. food. Perfect. Just remember that feeling. So now what we're going to do, we're going to go back tapping again okay i feel so good now now that i've let go of this vertigo i feel so good that now i feel no vertigo let go of this vertigo side of the eye i am perfectly balanced i am perfectly balanced i feel well i feel well there's no tears what happened that's, okay. that's good that's okay we, we let them go yeah i guess so under, under the eye it's easy for me to be in this state. It's easy for me to be in this state. It's collarbone. It is very natural for me to feel well at all times. It is very natural for me to feel well at all times. I continue to carry this feeling of wellness with me continuously and consistently. I continuously carry this feeling with me continuously. Consistently. Consistently, consistently. Grab your wrist. Now think about that, that memory, that feeling when you're feeling really good. Think about it, inhale, deep inhale. Exhale and let it go. Perfect, so how are you feeling now? How is your inner emotions feelings sensations take again take stock of your body physically emotionally compare it to how you feel now from where you started much better much better i mean no comparison because i was in a very poor spot perfect so you Sorry can do myself, this yes yeah, right? so you can do this with anything anything um, from physical sensations like headaches, pains, aches, vertigo, to emotional stuff. You have anxiety, you have a fear, okay? You're nervous, yes. Any, anything like that. You can, very simple. Why I love this method by Robert Smith. And by the way, I strongly recommend that you guys find him on YouTube okay. and you can just uh, look for faster EFT. He's a really great guy. He reminds me a lot of Dr. Morse because he's a very plain man, speaks plainly. You know, he curses. He's my kind of guy, <laughs> you know? Yes. Sort of like the people's man. Yes. And, and he makes it very simple and easy. And uh, you can learn a lot about how the mind works. Now, what a lot of the time keeps uh, can happen for you as, as it did for you is that you know the problem that presents itself is really not the problem it's only a symptom of the real problem and as we start to tap now we start to tapping into the problem that's why you started to feel like you wanted to cry you understand yeah, yeah. because that vertigo was only a symptom of something else that you were feeling and the more mm. you keep tapping it, it's going to come up. It will come back to you. All of a sudden, like for me, it's like peeling an onion. You start out with, let's say I'll give you an example because this is a real thing that happened to me. So I'm tapping. I was tapping on uh, financial insecurity. 
So I'm trying to get that going to, to feel more relaxed about money and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, a memory, a flashback. So it's almost like I'm watching it on TV. When I was in the third grade, I was nine years old. And instead of going home, I stayed back in school because I wanted to spend time with friends because I wasn't allowed to have friends. So by the time I got home, it was really late. And what my mother did, she kicked me out of the house. And it was, you know, November, it was cold. So I was outside, I was by myself. I was, and I was scared because she told me, go, don't come back. If, you, if you're going to act this way, I don't want you here. So for a child, now you're scared. Now you're thinking, now you're thinking about homelessness, right? So I'm thinking to myself, ah, so my money fear has to, probably has to do with this fear of being homeless and not having any resources as a child going to this memory. But as I keep tapping, 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 I realize, nope, this is not it. This is just another layer of that. Because as I keep tapping, then I remember that by the time I was finally allowed back in the house, which was like around midnight at that point, you know, I got a beating and my father was yelling like how worthless I was, how I never do anything right and how, you know, I'm just such a problem for them. I knew like so, so, and I go, oh, wait a minute. This is not about even the homelessness and not being able to provide for myself. This is about feeling like a complete worthless piece of crab who does not have any value. Because when you have no value, then you cannot provide, you, can, there, you have nothing to sell. You have nothing to monetize to be able to support yourself. So it wasn't really about money. It was about self-worth and value, you see? So, and as you start the process, you're going to sort of go through the layers because usually the first thing that you feel that's uncomfortable is just that, you know, tip of the iceberg. It's the symptom of the problem. But as you start tapping on it, you start going deeper, you start to, to discard those layers because you tapped out, you know, the vertigo. But wait a minute, now I have, now I have some sort of other emotion. Now I'm crying and I don't know why but you keep tapping on that and eventually it will reveal to you why you're crying. You understand? And then you discard that. And then you may find something else underneath. But it's extremely important that once you have tapped out the negative feeling that you replace it with something else. And this is especially important with memories. Now, understand that memories are not real events and they don't even depict real events. Because when you're having a memory, how are you envisioning it? For example, if I were to think about, you know, go back to the time when my dad was, let's say, beating me, the way, I, you know, if you are thinking about how it's happening to you, how you perceive it is different than when you are watching it in your memory. You understand? When it's in your memory, you're not really there. It's like you're watching from outside. So the memory is not actually real. You create it a copy, like a DVD, a construct that is actually altered. It's not even this depictive of real events, how they transpired. We attach judgments to them, right? Already, instantly, right? Correct. So the idea is that we go back, we tap out the feeling, and then what we do, we try to change that movie, that picture. And it can be subtle, okay? It could be, let's say, instead of when I come in, instead of my dad beating me, he hugs me. And he's smiling and he's nice. You understand? We want to wire that. We want to reconfigure that memory so that it no longer causes an irritation. Understand? And sometimes it helps, you know, if you're, if the memory that you are changing, you know, if it's in full color, then you can start by removing that color, now it's black and white, which reduces the intensity. Because sometimes it's too much of a jump for people to go from a very negative memory where there's violence and abuse and to make it happy. You understand they can't make that jump. So we can do this gradually where you go, all right, it's no longer in color, now it's in black and white. And you change something else about it where maybe it's not as aggressive, you understand? And then you keep going and changing until it's plausible to you because it has to be rational and plausible to your mind for it to accept it. You understand? So if you, let's say, if you were, remember an experience of being bullied, you're approaching, 
you know, some kids and you want to play with them and they reject you and you feel really upset. So what you want to do is you want to reimagine this where you're approaching them and maybe they don't accept you right away, but, but they're willing to talk to you. And as they do, then, then you say, oh, we, you know, we can actually have so much fun together. So it's about reframing. Without changing the memory, you will continue to recreate that uh, negative experience and you will continue to have a trigger in place that is going to make you want to alter your mindset through substances or certain behaviors that are counterproductive. Yes, or whatever, whatever it may be. Some people shop, some people have sex, some people clean, some people overexercise. You know, everybody's got a different thing. And some people are addicted to feeling bad. That becomes their identity. Some people are addicted to feeling sick. It makes them feel important. You understand? So you can be addicted to bad feelings. So there are all kinds of things that, that we are addicted to that may not be obvious because it's not heroin or it's not food, you know, or it's not gambling. You can be addicted to all kinds of things. Any, any other questions? follow-ups anybody else wants to try anything different is that why breatharianism is so hard to reach because um we think we're going to be very very happy without food with the food freedom right and then all these monsters come at us um for example well a couple interviews with jericho sunfire who who has been food free for a long time and then yet uh -huh. went back to juices just maybe just a couple of years ago he, in my humble opinion, he, he, did, he, he already did the exercise. Like he's just like brutal exercise uh, thing. So I think that shows that it all not was well, right? But you know, you, you have to be careful because the way you are framing this is you, you're looking at this as a negative experience. He may not have done yeah. this as a negative experience. This could have been just a choice of something that he wanted to do. You see what I'm saying? How, how we filter what's happening through our belief system and how we judge it. So, you know, like having judged going back to drinking juices is a negative thing. It may not be a negative I, thing at all for him, you understand, but this is a reflection of your consciousness, you see? Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of the time, you know, we don't know what the memory is because we don't have conscious recollection of it. And I'll give you a couple examples from my life. And yet, so you may not know what is triggering you because you don't remember the memory or something that happened and yet you are responding to uh to a stimulus anyway for example and this goes back to you know to dreams i i have a lot of lucid dreams and i have out-of-body experiences and i always try to keep track of them and recall them um so and this happened just a few days ago I dozed off and I had a, a sort of an interesting experience that I felt, but as I woke up, I couldn't quite remember it. Like I remembered pieces, but I couldn't remember what it was and it, it bothered me. So I said, all right, go into meditative state and tune into it and then let go what happens. So as I tried to tune into it, I couldn't see any pictures, but you know what happened? My body reacted in a very negative way. It's like when, when I am really scared, it's like this <laughs> dread comes into my chest and, and I felt tightness and restriction. And that told me everything I needed to know about the dream. Even though I couldn't remember it, the unconscious mind that holds the memory sent a signal to my nervous system that, that told me what type of a dream it was. You understand? Right. The fact that I felt unwell thinking about it, even though I didn't remember what happened, my nervous system knew because this, the unconscious mind that holds that memory sent a signal to my body. So how do you deal with that? You don't, and that's the beauty. You don't have to know what it is. You just step out the feeling that you let go of the feeling and you replace it with something positive, with a positive dream. You know, another mm -hmm. example is you know, uh, I woke up and I just really felt angry at my boyfriend at the time for no reason. 
And I was so crabby and I was going sniping at him. And he was like, what is wrong with you? And I didn't know, <laughs> right? And it was later that I remembered that I had a dream with him where he did something bad, you understand? And I was mm-hmm. mad, but, but consciously I didn't remember it, but yet still I reacted. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's always something behind it. We may not remember it. We may have been too young or it was a dream and it didn't record in our conscious awareness, didn't register, but the unconscious mind knows and it will respond. Our body and our nervous system is going to respond whether we remember or not. And then we're going to act out of it. Yeah. I'd like to ask you one question. Yes, go ahead. I'm um, Bivendry from uh, France. Nice to meet you. I'd like to ask you how many times uh, one must uh, do the tapping during the day? This is my, and it is only on the one part Both of the sides. Place. You can switch it up. You, it, it's not just the one. You can do two, two sides simultaneously if you would like. Okay, you, you don't oh, okay. have to do it on this side or that side. It depends. If you have okay. a free hand, sometimes people do this when they're driving. I tap multiple times a day. Anytime you get triggered by anything, okay. it doesn't matter. You're at the post office and somebody looked at you wrong and that made you feel not so great. I'll say, oh, I'm letting this go. I don't need this. It's okay for me to let this go. You understand? Yeah. And as you go through, you should tap every single day. And the best time to, to tap is in the heat of the moment when something is happening. Okay. But what you can also do, and this is what um, Robert Smith recommends, is that you create a diary where on one side, you're going to write down all your bad memories, worst stuff that ever happened to you. And in the back, you're going to write down all your great memories. So you will do what he calls inoculation where you proactively and preemptively are gonna go through these bad memories one by one, and you're going to reframe them in your head so that they don't trigger you somewhere down the line, okay? And once you're done with the, with the bad memory, you cross it off because you don't wanna go back and think about it and bring it back to life, you understand? Yeah. So you can do this on a daily basis, take five minutes. You have. You say, you look at your diary, you have the list of your memories. So you go, all right, today it's this one. All right, let's work on that. Mm-hmm. And let's do that, okay? And continue to add good memories because you want to have a bank of memories, like a database that you can always go back to easily so that you have something to draw upon when you are you know, re-imprinting and you want to borrow the good feelings from somewhere. Because a lot of the times will get you and then they can't think of anything (laughs) good and this you know it happens so you want to have something close at hand so that you finish you know you close out the cycle and you finish the process the other things i would like to ask you also even if it is an ancient memory Mm -hmm. that then comes from even past life if you believe in reincarnation the law of karma So even on this aspect also, it can be a good thing. For example, an emotion of a child. Yes, but you know, you gotta be careful because you know, when we go into these things, there's other memories from other lifetimes. It's almost like we're setting ourselves up Mm. to, 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 to to have more bad stuff. You understand? So you're, you're, it's like you're telling yourself that I can never be done with this. Therefore, I can never be fully well and healthy because if I'm done with this, then there's other stuff that I don't know about. And because I don't know about it, I can't do anything about it because I don't remember it. You understand? Yeah. And this is the self-defeating mechanism that, that negative belief that I can never be well enough because there will always be something that I cannot access. And this is how we set ourselves up for failure. And this is how we keep ourselves from being happy by, you know, installing this, these programs, there has to be something else that what I'm doing is not enough. And eventually I'm going to arrive at a place where this is the best I can do. And I'm still going to be affected negatively because there's stuff from the past life that I could not access. How stuff the past life works, there's no such thing as past lives or future lives. 
because everything exists simultaneously. The thing that you think of chronologically 3,000 years from now, relatively to where you are, and, it's, and whatever event is relatively, you know, maybe 400 years in the past, is it exists simultaneously in the, in the quantum field of probabilities. Yeah. They're only separated by vibrational frequency. Yes, that's why I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted so to come in about. In a sense, there, there, there are a multitude of of memories, past and future, of all kinds that are coexisting. Because once again, in the quantum field of probabilities, there are many versions to each event. So it's not just that memory is just fixed as being a bad memory or a good. Memory. It has many dimensions. So the idea is you in the present moment have the power because you are the one who decides which connections you are making. Are you making negative connections or are you making positive connections? Because any event, and I talked um, about this last week about the uh, probability function, a particle exists in all probable states simultaneously, which means any version of that particle that is possible is a reality, which is going to include bad things, good things, and neutral things. It's unavoidable. Everything that can exist does exist. Mm -hmm. The only question is why are you making connection to the negative aspects of that particle's experience? Mm -hmm. You see, it is a choice. That is, I wanted to come to the question of frequencies and uh, the quantum mm -hmm. field also. So when you are um, making the affirmation, yes. uh, when you are tapping, this brings a, another frequency in the body. That Correct. Well, everything is energy and, and yeah, energy everything, is yeah, of course. frequency. But you have to be careful with affirmations because if you don't believe the things you are I saying... Of course, they're not going. There has of to be course. emotional context behind it. You understand? Yeah, yeah. Sure, and sure. This is why I'm saying it's so important to to anchor good memories in. Like when you are feeling positive, when people are responding well to you, that's use that as your affirmation. Mm -hmm. Look how great I'm doing. People appreciate my, my knowledge. I am. Do you understand? Because then it's true. No, and then it's no. easy for you versus, versus, you know, you feel like crap, but you're telling yourself, I love myself unconditionally and you feel nothing of the sort. And guess yeah. what? You're going to go absolutely nowhere. And this is why it's important to have a bank of those memories or those events. Mm. When something good happens or you were able to complete a fast and you did so well, tap that in. It was so easy for me to do. My body listens to me. I respond to my body's needs. I understand the messages of my body. I am so in tune that it's so easy for me. You understand you do that. And when you do that, now you're going to remember that. Mm. And that is your affirmation. Yeah, I uh, I, we I need to, yeah. I understand that we need to speak from the heart, not only from the intellect. That yes. is the, yes. the big difference. Yes. And also, if uh, you are only thinking about all positive things that, that can happen to your life, you know? Yeah. yeah. Even erase all what has been uh, negative from the past. Don't mm -hmm. uh, think about it. Mm -hmm. So while tapping, this can enhance all what you are feeling for the, Everything. Of the future. Everything will affect all aspects of your life. If you think about it this way, what you believe about yourself mm -hmm. determines how you act. Of if course. you let's say let's say if you are on a on a soccer team and you're going to play another team, right? Mm -hmm. If you think that the other team is much better and you stand no chance of winning, how you play that game is going to be much different than yeah. when you are showing up thinking, "No, we're good. Our team is good. We can win this." You understand? Yeah, yeah. Sure. It makes yeah. sense for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It makes sense. Absolutely. So it's not about other people. It's not about other events. It's no. how you perceive yourself. Because you see a lot of the times when people are mean or nasty, and this is something that Revital had asked, it's not about you. They're not responding. But the way they're treating you is how they feel about themselves. Yeah. So the exactly. So they're showing you how, they're, how they feel about themselves. They're just projecting it out. 
Uh, so can I ask what I asked you about? Why is there so much evil also in, in, a, um, in a larger scale? I mean, the human history is full of bloodshed and, and suffering and torture and uh, um, abusing yes. and just being cruel cruelty uh, on a large scale it's not you know it's not a just a private but uh it's about nations it's about it's about empires all throughout history yes it's but napoleon it's hitler are made up of individuals correct nations and empires are made up of individuals and when individuals don't love themselves they're going to be aggressive you understand when, when you have a, a, a lack of self-love or you've been hurt, then you're going to perpetuate that hurt. You want to hurt other people. You know the saying, hurt people, hurt people. I can tell you from personal experience, you know, I have a younger brother who was, who is four years younger than me. So I was basically a toddler when he was born, but because I was being beaten, I would lash out. And I was a child. I would let, I would be smacking him. Do you understand? Because there was a, a behavior that was modeled to me that was bad behavior. And because I was so disempowered where I could not stand up for myself, I could not do anything, you know, against my parent, even though I, I wanted to fight them, I couldn't. So I found somebody who was smaller than me that I could, could take my aggression and frustration on. And this is where that comes from. A lack of consciousness when you are and another thing is you know we talked about this trance you are not there when you are triggered you are not being rational you're acting out of hurt so so it's not like you have a process i want to go and hurt this person unless you're a psychopath which that that is a thing they exist and they want to hurt people but other people feel so bad that they want somebody else to feel their pain so so that is what all the inquisition the holocaust all the, the genocides and you know just all it's it's not a random it's not a, it it yeah. it is consistent it has happened on a large scale throughout history um so that's what it's all about. I mean, think about it. The way we suffer trauma on an individual level, trauma is also suffered on a collective level. For example, in America, Black Americans have collective PTSD. They have suffered such, you understand, it's like being abused, beaten, and then Okay, so we stop beating you now, now just get over it. But these people actually have PT, same way as I was when I was being, I have, now I have issues. Now I'm being triggered by things, you understand? It's the same way for, for on, on a larger scale. So there has to be a healing that, that needs to occur. And it was the same with the Holocaust. Why Hitler was possible? Because of a certain family structure that is predominant in Germany which is an authoritative family structure where the father is the authority figure and nobody questions the father. And this is also very uh, dominant in, in religions, especially the ones that are really fundamentalist religions where there's an authority and we don't question anybody. So if we have the father figure, let's say Hitler was the father of the nation, if he says this is what we do, this is what we do. He can't be wrong. Obedience. Yes, yes. And that's well, also a side effect of abuse. Because if, you, if you're being knocked around and dad says you do this or I will, or I will kill you, or you're gonna, you, you're gonna become very subservient and very acquiescent. And also I think, I think that it is also about a collective consciousness yes. in the quantum field that okay. has allowed Holocaust to be Holocaust. I do think that. But what do you mean? Wrong. What do you think? Well, there are greater uh, reasons for this. You know, sometimes uh, a group of people, karmically speaking, 
will choose to experience a very negative event in order to teach the world a lesson. Because if you think about what happened after the World War II, this is when the Geneva Convention happened. This is when, you know, the rules of engagement were put in place, where the world said, wait a minute, we cannot have this happen again. You understand that this would, so sometimes a group of people, evolved beings, will make themselves, uh, you know, sacrificial lambs to, to make a larger lesson possible where the rest of the world had to go, look, we can't judge people for who they are. We cannot, this is not acceptable. We can never do this to anybody. This, this is not okay. And sometimes it takes such a drastic, you know, example of, of our um, lack of evolution and lack of love that, that for us to pay attention on a more collective basis where we go, whoa, wait a minute. No way, we cannot do this. We okay, so wait, have wake to up sure. Wake up call or something. Exactly. Wake up call. Correct. Correct. Now, something terrible is happening in Israel with all the injections, with all the vaccines. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel like it's, I don't know, something something's um, uh, very, very bad about it, sort of. Um, and it's also uh, only happening in Israel. And also people I try to speak with, old friends, a lot of people just sort of like, like you're saying, under trance, or you, I can't speak to them logically. And they're sort of so, um, they're sort of, I feel the energy, it doesn't matter what exactly the, the uh, we're talking about, I feel the rejection. Mm -hmm. I feel uh, the, the bad energies. So it's hard to talk to people sort of, you can't speak to, the, to them logically, sort of, I don't know, they're under spell, they're, uh, and, and a, lot of, a lot of smart people, I consider smart people, they, they took the sure. injection. It's like, it's like they were brainwashed. It's like they don't think for themselves anymore. And uh, I Well, don't you know, have to understand that just because somebody has a different belief system, doesn't mean that it's not valid to them it is also yes. understand that just because you can see someone and interact with them doesn't mean that they're actually in your reality but they're not and this is we, we've seen this in political climate where, where we're looking at the same thing and yet the person's perceptions is so completely off that you cannot comprehend how how they can interpret what is happening in front of them that way where you go, there really is no other way to see this. But to them, it's the same way. They cannot comprehend how we are not able to see it the way they see it. So we literally are existing in different realities. Understand that there's nobody in your reality except for you. Just because you're able to see someone doesn't mean that, that you are sharing the same vibrational space of reality. And now as the energies are accelerating, there starts to be more and more obvious division and separation of these realities where you can see very clearly the demarcations where you go, these people are completely off in a different direction. Like it's almost like, I don't even know that, that we live in the same world and we don't, you literally don't. My and guides I talk about this, like think about the, the, this sort of earth like an airport, a hub, you understand? Yes, you sort of share common space, but you're all traveling in different to different locations that you're not gonna share. Just because you're perceiving each other in this common area, doesn't mean that you're gonna be on the same plane, going the same direction, ending up at the same location. You're not. But if you're gonna start to be worried about what they're doing and, and how their plane is going, how they're getting there, it's, it's uh, not productive it doesn't get you anything. So the idea is you have to focus on yourself because you are the only person who determines the state of your reality. You are the observer of your reality. The oh. observer is the prime radiant that conceives and then perceives the reality he or she has conceived. Nothing that you perceive exists as it's all a part of your energy. You're emanating an electromagnetic structured field of energy that is coded information. 
And that information is translated into people, events, things, and so on. Okay? Uh, but that is happening so, with- So if you are perceiving something you don't like, don't own it. Because when you start to judge it, then you, you, you understand you're, you're getting on the same plane then. Because now you want to have, a, you cannot, the way to go about it is you do not invalidate what they're doing because within all that is, because universal energy by definition is all that is. And all that is must include everything, negative stuff too. Or otherwise it would not be all that is, it would only be some of what is. So the idea is that you have to allow for all that is to be, and you simply choose what your reality should be based on your preference. And you allow people to do whatever they want to do. It's their reality. You don't live there. You don't live in their reality. Why do you care what they're doing? Because it's close friends and family. It's family. But and that's okay. But you have to understand, like I said, there's separation happening. Relationships break up. If you are not vibrating on a similar frequency, yes. you cannot occupy the same physical space. And so yet what? there will be separations. And that's just a part of life because people choose their vibration and therefore they choose the reality they're going to experience because you, you don't live in a reality. You are the reality that you perceive. You, you are it because reality only exists in between your ears. It is a dream construct. It's not a tangible space like a room. It's not. It's a projection the same way when you have a dream and it's so vivid and it's so real and then you wake up and just like that, it's gone and you cannot get back to it. You cannot find that place on a map. You can't get in your car and drive there because it only, it's only here and yet it was so real. This is the same way, it's the same type of a dream but on a flip side, the other side of the coin and we're constantly alternating between these realities. So it's not like, you know, the dream began when you fell asleep. No, that reality is ongoing concurrently. It's just that you became aware of yourself there when you fell asleep and the stimulus from this reality was shut off so that you can focus on something else because we can only focus on one thing at a time. This is how our brain works. That's the limitation of our physical system. We can only perceive one thread at a time. So when this is shut off, then we can perceive ourselves in other realities, we already existing in our active in. And then at that time, when, when you sort of turn off the lights here, you are looking through the eyes of another version of yourself. I, no, I, I lost you a little bit. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about other people and then, and then. But other people is the same thing, you understand? You create, these people don't actually live in your reality. You create versions of them from your own particles. You understand? Okay. In their reality, their, their experience of your relationship could be completely different. Yeah, that answer is a, subject, a subjective uh, experience, interpretation. But there's always a reason why you're perceiving things. Anytime you have an emotional response to anything, it means that you have a definition about that thing. You would not be feeling things unless this was important. So what would you have to believe about yourself, this relationship, this situation for you to feel the way you feel? When you're feeling uncomfortable, when you're feeling this is not good, that means that you have a negative belief in place where you feel that it's not okay for these people to have their own reality. But, but essentially, it's actually not okay for you to deny them the right to have reality, however disagreeable it may be to you. Uh, I just find the best way is not to speak about certain topics. But that uh, limit, limits the uh, relationship if there are taboos and you cannot uh, raise a certain issue. But see, that in of itself is a negative belief because the belief is that you are limited as to whom you can interact with. There, there is not enough, the, the belief that you're operating from is that there's not enough people who reflect similar values to you, that you are somehow, you know, 
an outlier. You see what I'm saying? Because if you are, uh, if, if you remove limitations that you're going to find, there's a bunch of people that think just the same way as you, but because you're trying to hold on to those people and you want them to think that way, you're not seeing all the other people that are actually compatible with your ideas because you don't want to focus on them. You're too busy no, I, I to, do to put them I, to your, to over to your side. I do see the other people, but I'm saying close people to me, my family, mm -hmm. my kids. I mean, everybody is sort of brainwashed. They all went and, and got vaccinated. And, you know, it's terrible. Well, you, you think they're brainwashed? They think that you are a conspiracy. Yeah, they, they think saying? that so, there's some something wrong with me. I'm non-compromised. I mean, you have to uh, you have to get the shot. Otherwise, you cannot uh, you cannot. I don't know. You cannot go to places, different places. You're not allowed to. I'm afraid I'll lose my job because they're not going to let you in. Once yeah. the lockdown ends, you won't be able to access many places. This is going to be your visa, your green card. I don't know. So they're going to you're going to be marked. You're not going to be able to access different things if you don't. No, 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 no. See, that is your belief system. Yeah, it yeah, will create question. your reality. If you're going to mm -hmm. come from a place of fear where you're saying that this is how it's going to work if I don't do this, then this is what you're going to create. If you relax and you say that whatever is happening is okay, everything has to work for my highest good. I may not know in the moment how this benefits me, but I know that it must. And I'm going to wait for uh, my life to unfold and show me how it benefits me because you're prejudging something as negative. Go ahead. Yeah, one question. Do you think that the tapping uh, technique will help her in order to sort out the situation? It absolutely can, yes. To become a detached observer or whatever. Yes, Just absolutely. I wanted to tell you, my daughter is a medical practitioner. I am uh -huh. against vaccination, and she uh -huh. did it on herself. So uh -huh. what to do? Detached observer, it's her role. She's playing her role, that's all. You have, you, but you, and that's the thing, you have to love people enough to let them have their choices, even if you don't agree with them. And that's the it meaning hurts. of unconditional love, that you're not basing you know, your relationship on whether or not they're doing what you believe to be right. That they have the freedom to choose things, even to, to harm themselves. Yeah. They yes. have that freedom and you have to allow them to have that. Yeah. Yes, you but I just- You don't tell them you can't do this. So I just, can't talk to them about it. I mean, it's, they think it is right. I, I think it is wrong. There's, so we can't talk about the subject. Otherwise we both feel bad. There's, there are well, negative. Don't talk feelings. about it. Okay. So we talk about other things. Correct. Whatever you have in common. Always find try to find the common denominator that is loving instead of going to the points of disagreement. And you know what you will find once you open up the lines of communication when the other person does not feel attacked or threatened, you will find that they actually become much more receptive to your ideas. Also think about it this way. When you are trying so hard to convince someone of the righteousness of your idea, it's because you don't actually fully buy into that idea yourself. Because if, if you know for a fact in your bones that what you're saying is correct and right, then it doesn't matter what anybody else believes because truth is truth. It's irrelevant. The reason we people try to convince somebody and bring them all to their side is to actually help themselves to reinforce that idea that if people if I can bring these people over, then what I believe must be true. Then it is the right idea, you understand? So you need to examine why it is so important for you that somebody else sees things the same do and, and whether or not you really are as, as uh, confident in those ideas as you believe that you are, or as you tell yourself that you are. I don't know, but this particular topic, I mean, it's because it's very relevant what's happening around. They're trying to convince people and pressure people into doing that and shun people that are not doing it. 
I don't know. So maybe I, a bit paranoid, but uh, maybe uh, a what? Maybe a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, regarding this other thing, I uh, I asked you about why is there so much evil and uh, so much suffering throughout histories. Yeah, maybe it's down to the to the uh, individuals that were in control in the time, like Hitler, that there was something wrong with them, all his uh, uh, low self-esteem, and he took it out on, I mean, that's, it's all, it's all down to individuals, and Napoleon, and their, their complexes, and all their problems, so, but, but the, the point is that other, a lot of nations um, cooperated with them, how come, how come everyone cooperated with them? I mean, it's not necessarily that they co it cooperated. It's just that they didn't want to get involved because they were protecting their own interests. But I don't know if it's, it, I don't really care to go into the direction of geopolitics here. You know, this is not something I think is pertinent to our discussion. But the one thing I am going to say, Revital, is if you see so much evil and so much discord, then you have to ask yourself why that is happening. Remember the the analogy I gave last week with a soda fountain. It depends on your filter, what you have put in, what the flavoring is, because the energy is the same. The energy is neutral. But if it comes out a certain flavor that you are tasting bad or yucky, it's because of your filter. You know, kids play this game when, when, when they're in a car and they're trying to see who gets, who gets to, to see the most red cars. Guess what? All they see is red cars. Why? Because they're looking for them. So if you continue to focus on how much evil there is, you will continue to see examples of it. In reality, actually, universe is more positive. It contains both negative and positive, but in the middle, there is the balance point. And the balance point always tints, tilts toward the positive side. So actually, you know, in reality, the universe is more positive than negative. So if you're seeing so much discord, you have to ask yourself, why are you coloring your perception that way? Do you see? Just because something exists doesn't mean it has to be part of your reality, but you're making it because you have a lot of negative beliefs in place that serve as filters. And when that water comes in through the fountain, if you have the flavor that says, misery, evil, this is what you're gonna taste. You are, you are literally, you are the only person in your reality. So if your reality is filled with, with evil, misery, it's, feel, it's, it's filled with bloodshed, ask yourself, why? It's your reality, it's not mine, it's not Rx, it is your, remember we just said, your reality only exists in between your ears. Nobody else lives in your reality. So if this is how your reality looks to you, you are the director. You're the person to go to about this and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I making it so? It doesn't have to be that way. And I guarantee you, once you shift it, you start to see more people being kind to each other, more cooperation you will start to see things change and relax. Because the world is a reflection of you. People are up in arms and about their governments. You are the government, literally. It is an aspect of your consciousness. Ivana? Yes. Thank you. Thank so you. Yeah, so I would like to suggest maybe you could reiterate the uh, basic guidelines for EFT, basic, uh, yeah. basic points, and then if it's possible, maybe we can have a little uh, guided uh, session of EFT where each one of the people who are present will think about some kind of their problem or things that they oh. would like to handle, and then we could just okay. do it all together uh -huh. just to practice. Absolutely. So... Uh, again, I want to make a distinction between classic EFT and faster EFT. 
I don't know if you want to go to classic EFT, which I think has more points, more complicated, is not necessary. You know, you have the side of the hand. This is where you set up your affirmation. And then you start tapping with the eyebrows. Then you go to the side of the eye. You go under the eye. You go under the nose here between lip and the nose. Then you go under the chin. Then you go collarbone. Then you go under the arm. Then you can do the liver. And then you, you do the top of the head, you know, and then you do the wrist. This is classic EFT, okay? And you go through all of these points. Now, faster EFT, you use a lot less points and you get a lot more done. So faster EFT, we only do the eyebrows, the side of the eye, under the eye, collarbone, and the wrist. First, you identify feeling, emotion, sensation. Once you have it, you let it go. You cannot stay in it while you're tapping because that means you're, you're remaining in a trance. And sometimes what happens is that people really get caught up in it and they can't get out. So that, and then the tapping doesn't work because they're too involved. Like if somebody triggered you was not nice to you and now you're having this uh, conversation, this argument in your head with the person, even though the person is not there, you understand you're only arguing with a fake person in your head because you wanna drive your point home. So you're going back and forth. So you're in a trance, you can't snap out of it. You can't stop that that wheel turning in your head. In that case, you can do a couple of things. You can do the side to side eye movement because it brings you back. And the way you do it, one, you, you're looking up, your chin is up, you try to do that. Another thing you do is fake laugh. And this, I know it sounds silly, but it's extremely effective. Like you have a problem and now you're, now you're stuck in this trance, you keep rehashing, that scene or memory and you want to keep going but you're stuck in there you're too deep what you do you stop yourself and you just laugh out loud as as ridiculous as it sounds and what does that that does it breaks you out of the trance now when you once you're out of the trance you start tapping i let it go i let it go it's easy for me to let it go it's safe for me to let it go wrist peace inhale exhale let go. Check back. Where are you with regard to the intensity of that feeling or emotion? Are you at zero or are you still maybe at five or two or three, whatever it may be? If you are not at zero, you go back to tapping. Once again, very simple. I let it go. I'm letting it go. It's safe for me to let it go. It's easy for me to let it go. I have no resistance to letting it go. Wrist, inhale, exhale, peace. Now, when you think you are at zero, try to bring it back. See if you can bring that feeling back. If you can, then you are not done with it yet. Then you go back to tapping again until it's, it's, it's done, okay? Now, once it's done, now we go to the positive end. Now, whatever it was, like if, if you had a problem, let's say it was a food, right? You were craving a food and you're, and you know, that's bad for you and saying, I am easily satisfied with my juices. It's so easy for me to get all the nutrients and fullness from this juice. I don't need anything else. My body does not require much more and I feel very fulfilled and satisfied with it. Wrist, inhale, exhale, peace. Bring back some sort of good positive memory to that. Feeling, not memory itself, but feeling you are tapping into positive memory to sort of borrow the emotional energy, the feeling, to use it to anchor now these positive affirmations in, okay? Does that make it clear? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Maybe you okay. could guide us into um, intellectually in short guided session, is it possible? Raise your hands, I'm here, who wants to volunteer? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I mean that we all do it together, each one for themselves, just to, to really uh, for you to tell us, okay, now put your finger here. Now, okay, now, well, now do me, that. It's hard to do for everybody because everybody has a different situation they're dealing with. You understand? Ah, so okay. the word I might use for a food craving would be different if mm. I am. Uh, if we're talking about a pain in your in your shoulder, you understand? Just sure. for, for just for that reason, it's not uh, really feasible to do that with everybody ah. unless we want to put in just positive stuff. I forgive myself. I forgive all others. 
I release all negative feelings and emotions. I let things go that no longer serve me. Like this we can do all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be amazing actually because then people could also cut it out maybe this part and just do it on a daily basis or something like that. Yeah, just to- And you can do it, for example, you wake up in the morning and you're just feeling lackluster. You didn't sleep well. You're like, and you go, I let it go. I let this, you know, tiredness and this lack of energy go. I release it. It's okay for me to let it go. I release all resistance to this tiredness, to this fogginess. I let it go. It's so easy for me to do that. Grab the wrist. Inhale, exhale, peace. And then you can go into... I have unlimited reserves of energy available to me. I get my energy supplies directly from the source that is constantly flowing into me under the eye. Go under the eye. It's so easy for me to get energy. I feel every cell being charged with electricity and waking up. It's like millions and billions of little lights are being turned on in my body as my cells come alive with this energy. Grab the wrist, inhale, exhale, peace, insert a positive sensation feeling when you felt yourself being energetic, ready to go when things just flowed, anchor it in. Now check back with yourself how you're feeling. And you can do this if you're feeling lack of focus. You know, you have a lot of stuff to do, but you're procrastinating, okay? And then you need to shift that. It's the same thing. First, I let this go. And I forgive myself for procrastinating. I am not judging myself for this. I simply let it go. It's easy for me to let it go. I am not judging myself. I release all resistance to doing what I need to do wrist, inhale, exhale, peace, insert feeling from when you were feeling good. It doesn't have to be like that kind of exact memory. You just have to feel good. There has to be just emotional charge when you were feeling good. You just have to sort of imprint that. So the situation doesn't have to be similar. You understand the situation that you are tapping on doesn't have to be similar similar to the memory that, that you are drawing on. It's just about the feeling, the feeling, the emotion, that energy has to be genuine and has to be real for it to work. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in, so in this case, uh, uh, how, how, we, what kind of affirmations would you put in? Because we just finished the round of, uh, I'm forget, I'm forgiving myself for not doing things and stuff like that. But yeah. so. You can use whatever, just use your intuition. You understand whatever, what is the positive thing that that is opposite of what what you're trying to Ah, get at? You understand? Yeah. So maybe we could complete this another round of, uh, because we kind of just stopped in the middle because we did this round of letting go about this situation. Give me a specific thing. Give, give, Give me a specific thing that everybody would benefit from. Do you have an idea? No, I mean, uh, we were doing it about uh, procrastination. And then we... Okay. Uh, and then, so and then, then we I let it, it go. So you let yeah. go of procrastination. I let it go. Oh I let go of sitting around and doing nothing. Side of the eye. I let go of this anxiety that keeps me from starting the project. Because there's always something that's keeping you from starting, right? So I let it go completely. Collarbone, I release this idleness. I release this procrastination without judgment. Wrist. Inhale. Exhale. Peace. Insert that your positive emotion. Check with yourself. How are you feeling? Are you feeling more motivated right now? Okay, check with yourself. If you are not, we go back again to tapping it out. I let go of this procrastination. 
I let go of my fear of starting a project. I let it all go. It's so easy for me to let it go. Under the eye, it's the most natural thing for me to get up and start moving around and doing stuff. Collarbone, it is my natural inclination to want to be productive. I am motivated and I trust that I have what it takes to get things done. Wrist again, inhale, exhale. Peace, insert the feeling. We can go another round. Eyebrow, I love it when I'm productive and getting stuff done. It makes me feel so good, side of the eye. I am so good at so many things. I am very competent and I take things on without any fear under the eye. It's so easy for me to get going because I find the work that I have to do so rewarding. Collarbone. I accept the work in front of me with joy and appreciation. And I look forward to the results of my work. Wrist again, squeeze, inhale, exhale. Peace, anchor it in with a positive feeling, feel the feeling. And now again, let's check in. How are you feeling now? Are you feeling more motivated? Yeah, I feel nice. Nice day. Feels very um, good, yeah. Good. I don't know why, I was feeling well, but only after this You're tapping, uh, uh, only after this tapping, I started feeling I'm yawning like anything. Ah, then okay. I was very fresh. I, I didn't have any, I, I was not at all tired, but I don't know suddenly why I'm yawning. That's okay. That's all right. See, something came up as you started to tap. It triggered something else. So now you're tapping on that. Oh, I didn't know it was there, but I'm letting it go. Now that I know that, that it's in me, it's so easy me to, for me to let it go. I'm so glad, side of the eye, that this uh, lack of energy became apparent because now that I know it's there, I can let it go very easily under the eye. It's safe for me to let this go. I don't need this. It serves no purpose. Therefore, I release it without any resistance. Collarbone, I let it go gently, nice and easy without judgment. Grab your wrist. Inhale, deep breath in. On the exhale, peace. And think of a good, vib you know, vibrant feeling as you're doing this, as you're holding your wrist. All right, how is it, how is it now? It's like I want to yawn, but it's restric uh, restricting me from yawning. All right, so you see, we scaled it down. We didn't take it out completely but you reduced it. You still have that little bit of that energy that has the impulse, but it's not, doesn't have enough force to power you through. That's okay, we go back. Switch it up, go to the other eye. I, re I release whatever little bit of this tiredness and fatigue is left. It's okay. I am not judging myself for it. Side of the eye. I am releasing it fully and completely without any resistance. It's very easy for me to do. It requires no special effort. I am simply letting it go under the eye. I feel it leaving my body. It's moving out of my system very quickly. And in its place comes energy and vitality, collarbone. I release it all now every little bit and piece of the remaining fatigue. I let it go now, grab the wrist, inhale, say peace on the exhale, anchor it in with a good feeling. 
All right, check back in, and see what's happening. When we, we, we came here that I am releasing it or I'm letting it go. Yeah. And till then I had this feeling that it's here till my uh, throat Your and throat? it's not coming out, but it, it left. See, and this is, an, uh, this is a great example. It will be in your body. You will feel it in your system. But the trick is not to focus on it because the more you focus on it, you don't want to stay with it. Once you have felt it, you know where it is, you let it go. You take your mind out of it. Then you focus on the tapping, focus on your fingertips, focus on the places you're tapping because if you are continuing to hold on to that feeling, you will stay in it. You see what I'm saying? Then you won't release it. So the idea is it's important to identify it, to find it, but then you got to leave it alone. Got to get out of it. We got to get out of that trance. That's the bad trance. So first we go into bad trance because we just want to locate what, what part of the brain we're looking at or working with. Then we get out of the trance. So, so that's bad trance, no trance tapping, then good trance. And good trance being good uh, emotional content that we're borrowing from another memory. Wonderful uh, experience. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, can I do a uh, tapping things that uh, you know sure. on in some kind of issue that um, I sometimes find, just like I said, when speaking with people, sort of um, we're getting to these places, then and then I feel bad about it. You know, I feel like uh, with a vaccine or a way of life, and you know, trying maybe to convince people, maybe I'm over uh enthusiastic or and and i feel it it um uh, creates resistance from other people they sort of don't want to hear me <laughs> uh, well you're the one that's putting up resistance and they're simply you understand you're creating resistance to them and they're simply giving it back to you you see how that works so you can start by tapping and saying I let go of my expectations that I have for other people. I let go of these expectations. I let go of the need of other people to accept my opinions and beliefs. It's very easy for me to let it go. I let go of the disapproval that I feel toward other people's beliefs. Collarbone. I feel neutral and I allow people to have their beliefs. I am not bothered by them, so I let them go easily without any resistance. Grab your wrist. Inhale, deep inhale in. As you exhale, you say peace and you anchor in a good feeling, feeling of ease, of non-resistance. And now go back to how your disposition is with regard to this uh, particular issue. Are you still at the same place? Is it reduced? Is it gone? Where are you? Uh, it's reduced. It's not gone yet, but it is. It's okay. Reduced. All right. That's okay. So we go back. I continue to let this resistance go. It's okay for people to believe what they believe. Side of the eye. I don't need the people in my life to follow the same beliefs as I do. And I let go of having these expectations of them under the eye. It is so easy for me to let this go. It makes no sense for me to hold on to this idea. And so I release it easily. I let go of all ex expectations. I forgive everyone for their beliefs and ideas, but you got to tap. You're not tapping. I don't see you tapping. I am. It doesn't work if you don't do it. <laughs> yes, I am doing it, but. Okay, I got to tap here. Okay. 
I forgive myself for having these expectations. And this forgiveness allows me to disengage. Grab the wrist. Once again, inhale deeply. On the exhale, you think to yourself, peace. Insert positive feeling. As you, so you want to be imprinting the positive feeling while you are squeezing the wrist because this is where you're actually putting pressure on those points, okay? The beautiful thing that happens the more you do this, this, is, this is becomes an anchor, grabbing of the wrist and saying peace. So down the road, once you've done this enough times, you won't even need to do the whole thing. You can just grab your wrist and say peace and it's going to automatically work because it's gonna be like a well, you know, traveled path. You're gonna make those neural uh, networks, those highways where it becomes just a thing. It, the brain knows what that means. <laughs> Once you grab your wrist and you go, peace, all of a sudden it just comes. The peace comes, you no longer have to do all of that. It's like a shortcut. That's the value of, of having an anchor. So how are you feeling now? Much better. Better. Yeah, I, I can feel it. Um, so you shifted. More relieved. More relieved. Uh huh. But what what number on the scale from one to zero? About two. Okay, so we're going back. I forgive everyone for their beliefs. They can do whatever they want side of the eye, they're entitled to their own choices. And those choices don't have to be exactly the same as mine. Under the eye, I still accept and love them, regardless of what they choose to believe. Collarbone, I afford them the same courtesy that I afford to myself, which is the freedom of belief and choice. I forgive myself for judging them. And I forgive them for not following in line with my viewpoint. Grab the wrist. Inhale. Exhale, peace. Insert positive feeling. And we're gonna go back again. I love everyone unconditionally. And by loving them, I allow them to make their own choices. Side of the eye. Everyone else is free to believe what they want, just as I am free. Under the eye. Just because they have a different opinion than me, it doesn't make them any less valid or any less correct. It is simply a neutral opinion and I allow them to have it. Collarbone. Other people having diverging opinions has no impact on my life because I am in control of my reality and I am the only person who creates my reality. And so everyone gets to have what they want and need and I allow it without any resistance. Grab your wrist. Inhale. Peace on the exhale. Good memory, memory of you having fun with people, having accord with people, having good exchange where there's no disagreements or strife, where everything is in harmony. And now go back again to your feeling, check it. See what's going on? A tiny bit is still left, just a tiny bit. Okay, that's fine. So we go back. I scrape up every little bit of resistance that I have remaining against those that hold different beliefs than me. 
and I simply remove it side of the eye. It's almost like I'm taking a broom and sweeping it out onto the street. I don't need it. It's not productive and so it's easy for me to let it go under the eye. I allow these beliefs to exist and to be as they have the right to. Collarbone. These beliefs that other people hold have no impact on me. They're solely the property of those people who hold them and it's okay for them to have it. Wrist. Inhale, exhale, peace. Bring the memory and feeling of harmony. See yourself having fun and a good time with people when you're not arguing about stuff, when these beliefs are irrelevant. And we're gonna go back again. I love my friends and my family. They're all good people. Having different beliefs side of the eye does not make them any less good. It does not affect how much I love them. Under the eye, my love for them is unconditional and they can believe whatever they want to believe and we can still come together and have a great time. We can still love each other and be there for each other. Collarbone, I forgive myself for holding these beliefs. I forgive them for not reflecting to me what I wish they reflected. I forgive everyone. I love them and I love myself. Wrist, deep inhale. Exhale on peace. And once again, anchor it in with a beautiful memory of harmony cooperation, and friendship. And now go back again and see where you are. That's it. It's, a, it's over. It's, you did it? Perfect. It's out of the system. Good. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank now, you. be careful. Don't try to go and, and bring it back from the dead. <laughs> you can do that. So there's, once you let it go, like really let it go. Don't go back there. You understand? Okay. Let it be, and if it comes back again, you go back. Even if you're on the phone with your children and they start talking to you and it starts to trigger you, I'm letting it go. It's okay, I let it go. Just say it in your mind, okay? And just keep tapping and, and you will see how that shifts your feelings. Okay, thank you. Thank you're you. Welcome. Do we have a, a couple more minutes? Just, uh, I just wanted to ask Ivana if you have a bit more clarification about writing. How powerful is it to write those bad ones? And some of the things that I've done, I was so uneducated and so, so blonde. I'm sorry for anyone blonde, but okay. so bad. Um, so I have guilt, right? About well, those. The guilt come, okay, so, but you see this as self. So I don't want to write them down. No. I'm going so to write them down. Lack of self love. So, this is the one thing you, you have to. There's no perfect way or right way to do it. You understand? Right. This is just an accounting. You don't have to like write it out. You don't have to write it out like a script. It's just the memories. Like for me, if I, let's say, you know, a memory, I got kicked out of the house because I didn't come home from, like, you don't have to go into the script. It's just so that you know what you're working on. That's it. Right. Okay, so it could be just a word, a keyword about it. As long, yeah, as long as as long as you understand what it is, this is just for you to keep track, so that when you decide that you have some time to work on things, you don't have to work so hard to think about it, to try to, okay. to figure okay. out. You understand? This is just so like a, a, a legend. Yeah, yeah just okay. for reference. That's it. Okay. You don't have to burn it, literally burn it and stuff no, like just, that. You know, once you're done with the negative one, cross it off because you don't want it to be there in your mind to constantly remind you. Once you're done with it cross it off you want to you want to tear out the paper tear out it just you just don't want to keep going back over it okay thank you thank you mm -hmm. i really appreciate it oh you're so and welcome. I, 
if we write to you your, your email um, that we have on a link, um, do we get some? Because uh, I went on your website, your website. there is no. Um, well, you can email still... me directly from my through my website. There, there is uh, right. A okay. Link there. You can I don't use... want to talk about it, but I would love to have some consultation. So I sure. just yeah, you can you can uh, or you can find me because I'm I'm in the fasting group. So you can also uh, contact me through WhatsApp. Right. I but am I'm on there. Your time and your efforts. So I, I'm I'm going to try to see if it makes me Certainly. makes my budget work with your budget. <laughs> Certainly. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, you can either email me from my website or you can just go through WhatsApp. If you go into the group information, there's a list of people. You just find me there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. Ivana, I, I have two short questions. First of all, at, at the stage when we insert positive feeling after saying peace, can yes. it also can it can we facilitate it by imagining different situations? For I'll give you an example. And if, let's say we work on a particular uh, social situation. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just imagine this uh, uh, situation where the communication flows freely and everyone is happy rather than remembering uh, um, specific yes. uh, as long As long as you feel viscerally yeah. that, yeah, that yeah. emotion strongly, that is the, that's what's important. Mm. You understand? Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. It's the content. It's just that it's easier to connect to something that already is real mm -hmm. versus something that's more nebulous. Yeah, in my in my case, I have I, I, in my case I have this ability to imagine things and actually feel them to, to feel mm -hmm. the emotions there. But you can also check this how effective it is because once you do that, then you once again you take accounting of what yeah. is happening. You take stock and you will see if it worked. If not, then you know go to something else but that's why i say have a list of good memories okay that that, that you understand so yeah. something you can go to easily like when your daughter was born and mm. you felt so good you felt that that should be yeah. an easy thing for you to connect to you understand ah, okay yeah yeah i got you know it so it's not like you this is what i'm saying it doesn't have to be like where we are having fun i just picked that just because yeah. I, mean, I don't know Revital now what's in her head, but she talks about these being her friends. So I'm sure there were times or instances where things were in accord. So I just brought that up. So yeah. you're going to tailor this to your own mind and, and put it into context of your own life. Right. So you understand, but what we want, we want a real feeling, not yeah. fake feeling, not like mm. we're forcing something. And for yeah. you, especially for parents, it's so easy because you have, you already have that love that, you know, you're proud of your daughter. She went, you know, her first day in the kindergarten, she got a gold star or whatever, and your heart is just so full. It's so easy for you to go to that feeling. You understand? Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. have to mirror, uh, the, the event doesn't have to mirror the emotion or, or the circumstance that you're working on. It's yeah, just yeah. That's an imprint. That's all. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Completely. Mm -hmm. And my my second question is whether we can use uh, this uh, shortened EFT technique just to install positive affirmations in ourselves without necessarily taking something negative that we want to work. Because when uh, Jordan at her seminar, I think she said that uh, we can use EFT for that as well. But I just wanted to ask your opinion. You can, but here's what you have to look for. If you have a belief or a memory or something that is at odds with that positive feeling you're trying to install, you're mm -hmm. gonna feel it's gonna come up for, mm. for how it shows up for me. So that shows you because the thing is without changing that core belief, you can't put stuff on top of it. You ah. have to change that, you understand? Yeah. Because they're, they're in conflict. So for example, how it works for me, like if I start to try to anchor in how much I love myself, all of a sudden I start crying. Why? Because then I actually feel that way. So it evokes an emotion and it evokes an emotion because of lack of that feeling that I'm trying to imprint. Mm. See? So then what I have to actually do, I have to take that feeling out yeah. and then bring in, but it, it can vary. You understand? You don't, you don't necessarily, you may not necessarily have a negative thing to put to, take out so once again you're going to see it as you do it mm -hmm. because if it, it feels not genuine if it feels hollow 
or if you start to, to it starts to bring out feelings yeah in you then you know that you first have to take care of business and reframe something before you can put something new in yeah yeah that's that's a very good point yeah i got it and also something that came to my mind now how could you go over the subject of overeating over drinking over consuming food substances uh, uh, in terms of um affirmations and in terms well, of well all of that working. first of all understand we have to understand what the core problem is it's not about the food it that we're so empty that we need what we need it's because we don't have love and we equate food with love right so it's not about physical hunger mm -hmm. so you're saying you let go of the hunger right? You let go of it. And then you bring fulfillment, satisfaction, and then you tap what you got to do, especially on the food, you have to tap the taste out of it. So you, and the way you do, you can actually put the food in front of you and you okay. start tapping. All of these taste sensations are not real because this food is not good for me. This food, if let's say pizza, this is nothing than just eggs and flour. Food is simply nourishment. Food does not have emotional value. Food does not provide emotional satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Food has nothing to do with love. This pizza does not love me. Do you understand? These are the kinds of things. So, and you, then you reduce the taste sensations that you are that you are being stimulated. And then you can even take the, a bite of food and see if you still feel like, oh my God, does it still feel as, taste as good to me? And you will see that it will not have the same impact. And you do this until you remove the emotional connection from that food. Yeah. And if it's something good, but just too much, how would you go for that? I am in touch with my body. I can sense when my body has had enough. Mm. I am very much aware how much my body needs. And my body sends me the signal when it is full and, and has what, everything that it needs. Mm. Okay. Things like that. Okay, very good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, who else has any questions? Yes, hi, this is Ruchi. Hi. 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 <laughs> I know I have a to do, still pending. I'll okay. take it. That's okay. I take your time. Sure. So the question that I have is um, so I wake up early in the morning for my meditation and then I fall asleep in my chair often. <laughs> it happens often and then I miss my exercise routine which I would love if I can get it done at the time um, that I have assigned but then I do my exercise regardless do the exercise first then you won't fall asleep during meditation yeah but it's kind of early gonna, but that's the point meditation is not about sleeping but the exercise is going to wake you up so that when you do the meditation you're not going to fall asleep you're just going to be mindful so you have to switch up the order of things switch the routine mm -hmm. yes switch switch the order yep okay okay and if and what i sensed a little bit resistance right setting your butt and it work on that resistance you understand ask yourself why did you decide to have the resistance what kind of uh, uh purpose it serves oh uh, you mean why am i resisting doing exercising before meditation Correct. yes because the timing when i wake up is kind of early so the thought of exercising at that time doesn't did not sink in so but you see what, what you're saying is that you're not really meditating. You're, you're pretending to meditate so you can catch extra sleep. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. how, this, is, this is how we deceive ourselves. And that's mm -hmm. okay. You see, and that's okay. And you go, first of all, I would tap before going to sleep. And I would mm -hmm. tap on saying, when I wake up, I am ready to go. I am rested. And I do the things that I plan to do with joy and and you know gratitude so that when you wake mm -hmm. up and you wake up and you start to go i release any remnants of the sleepiness i wake up now okay i start moving around i i i am motivated same thing we did with motivation i am motivated to get started i so first you release any grogginess but i 
would do tapping beforehand so that when you wake up, you're, you already programmed yourself. So you, when you wake up, you don't have that resistance. You're happy to get started. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be sitting down in order to do tapping, right? You so as this, you... you can do this in line at the post office. It does not matter at any time. Just start going. Somebody, somebody is looking at you wrong. You know, your cab driver is being rude. I'm letting it go. It doesn't matter if he thinks you're crazy. It's so simple. It takes less than a minute. I let it go. It's okay for me to let it go. It's easy for me to let it go. I release it all now. Peace. Anytime, anywhere. Eyes open, eyes closed. It does not matter. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. It may sound very crazy, but uh, I don't know why. But every time I have started doing this uh, tapping, I have first pain, then burning sensation and numbness. Where? Uh, the numbness goes away after a few minutes, but yeah. the pain and burning sensation remains long. Where? That's why every time I start it and then I, after two days, I stop it do, doing it. Well, no, this is where you, you want to keep going because it's showing you that there are underlying issues that you are not aware of. Okay. You see? Because what happens once you start tapping, whatever, remember when I read off the list, what emotions are held in which point? You start tapping, they start to come up, you start to release them. That's you right. see? So then you go, oh, I found, I just found something. This is exciting. I didn't know this was here, but now that I know, I'm going to let it go. So I have this burning sensation. Great. Now that I know it's there, now I can let it go. You understand? And what then may come up again as you tap, now it may actually connect you to a memory of, of an event as you tap. So I've seen this progression. You start tapping because a lot of the time I just tap for no reason. Like, and I start off with, I release all negative feelings and emotions. Whatever is there, I let it come up and I release it and I let it go. And believe me, if there's something there, it's going to come up. But now that if you know that it's there, you know what you're aiming for. Now you go, oh, okay, let's get this out of here. And you do that. And as you keep tapping, it may actually now give you flashbacks where it links to specific events. And you go, ooh, okay, now I can reframe this memory that is giving me the burning sensations. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Ivana, do, do you think... Ivana. Ah, sorry. Yeah, just a follow on question there, right? So it may come up either in a uh, physical sensation or even in a form of. Oh, yes. Thought. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sometimes, you know, especially with certain feelings, you may not actually have the event, but all of a sudden for me, I would feel it. It starts in my chest and I can actually feel it move, 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 move into my throat and then get stuck here. And then I just tap it on letting go until it's gone. And it depends also on the kind of person you are. Some people are more kinesthetic, means they're feeling things in their body. Other people are more visual. So they're going to be seeing things. They're going to see flashbacks and memories and stuff like that. Other people may be hearing things. So it all depends on the person. There is no right or wrong way to go about this. It just depends on how you process, how your brain processes information and what's you know more natural to you. And it could just be a thought. Right, it may not Absolutely. be a visual. Or... Absolutely, okay. but, but you want to examine what that thought is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I watched uh, one woman uh, have a session and she had a pain in her shoulder and she's been in physical therapy and nobody, nobody can help her. But it's also, you look at what part of the body the pain is on, you know, right side is the male side of the body. So it could have problems with men. It could be a father, it could be a brother. You understand as you kept, keep tapping and go, all right, I forgive all the men that have wronged me or hurt me or stuff like that. You may not know it, but I guarantee you as you keep tapping, the thing is you keep looking at how you are releasing stuff. Is it still there? And if it's there, you gotta keep tapping. Sometimes like this guy, Robert Smith goes, you tap till it's gone or till you pass out. And when you come back to your consciousness, I promise you, it's going to be gone. You're going to feel better. <laughs> Sometimes it's deep. Sometimes these things are deep. And I promise you, you may not know what it is now. It will 
make itself known. You work on it long enough, you will make the connection. It will come up. And then once you make the connection, then you, then you know what you need to change or reframe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ivana, do you think um, in the fasting state, EFT might be even more effective because the emotions are more easily accessible? Absolutely. If, if I, next time I go on a, on a fast, all I'm going to be doing, it, I'll be tapping nonstop. Because this is where, you know, this is where a lot of things come up. And also this is where you can actually use EFT to help your body. This is another thing that I wanted to mention. As I said, these points coincide with meridians. And what I found that within a few days of tapping, but this is, you have to do this every day. Because when normally people only use EFT on a need to basis, like when they're having a crisis. But if you do this on a daily basis and you're hitting these organ meridians, you will find that your organs start to function better. My filtration, my kidney filtration has doubled sediment as I started to tap. My gallbladder function improved. I had difficulty digesting fats within a few days without doing any other herbs, without doing any fasting, anything, all of a sudden I was, I was digesting. And I was like, oh, this is, this is interesting. So while you're fasting, you can do so many different things. With Ivana, I'm, I'm sorry, but did, did you take those subjects of organ functioning as the subject of your tapping or you just no. tapped? Uh, no, 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 nope. I was tapping on emotional issues, but um, again, emotional issues cause physical issues. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Like all of these points that they correspond with, with organs, for example, this is the gallbladder point, but gallbladder is about rage and anger. Mm -hmm. You see, so you tapping yeah. on emotions and you're releasing that stuff. And once you, once you release the emotion from the gallbladder, you also improve its function. Yeah, sure. Sure. So, so the, the first point is more in the direction of the third eye or it's more in the direction of- No, this is, this is where your eyebrow hairs begin, right yeah. here in the corner, yeah. right here. But if yeah. you look at, at maps, this whole, this whole line here you have where the, the eyebrow begins, this is all the gallbladder meridian. So we tap here, but even you can even do this. You will mm. still get it, you understand? But, but on the same level as the beginning of the eyebrow, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, mm, I see. Okay, yeah. Ivan, and also if we, we have uh, we have one question from Vilas uh, here on the chat. So if you could open the chat and relate to that. Let's see, the bank of memories. Can the mind store it in two separate sections, each of good and bad? Will tapping get rid of the bad memories forever, or it can emerge again when the similar situation comes up? Okay, so first and foremost, if a new situation comes up, as I said, tap in the heat of the moment. You release it right away. You understand something bad happens. You don't even want to store it. You let it go right away. You don't even begin to, to create you know, a file for it. So that is that. Now, uh, tapping can get rid of bad memories forever if you do it right, if you understand how the mind works, how to reframe the memory okay so yes but what other what sometimes people do is that they keep going back to it it's like you you have somebody uh, and you help them tap out um th their their obsession with a certain food but then they miss the feeling they were getting so now they're forcing themselves to eat it to to you know to recreate that feeling again and you can go back there if you do that you understand so it depends on on what you do with it so in that case that you mentioned just now what would be the right way to go about it well stop doing that you're the one doing this to yourself if you, if you're saying that i want to tap out uh, you know and not crave pizza again but then you go you you looking for some pleasure in your life and you can't think of anything better than you start to eat pizza tr trying to reactivate those same feelings that, that you had previously had for it. I mean, this is just you being stupid. There's nothing I can do for you. Now there's nothing tapping can do for you. 
Yeah. You want to sabotage yourself? That is your choice. You can do that, but it's not the fault of tapping or tapping not being effective. It's just that you know you. Yeah. You so the, to, so to the, keep so the solution would be to find more meaning in your life. Correct. You know, replace it with hiking. You understand? Uh, spending time with friends, reading, doing something constructive, and plant that. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted to ask: when we say peace, uh -huh. can can we visualize something like uh, like on the word peace itself, or it's just sure, as long peace? as it's good, as long as it's good, absolutely, yes. Yeah, so it can be okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. Does anyone else want to ask anything before we wrap it up? It's just one last question. I think Ivana, you said, and I just wanted to confirm that once you do tapping enough and you hold your wrist, mm -hmm. I think you said in once you have enough experience with it, uh, you can just hold the wrist and those vibrations of peace will yes. radiate through you. So you don't yes. have to go through the whole tapping. Yes. But again, it's like, it's like you have to imprint it. Like you have to, it's like when you're walking through the field of grass, you have to walk long enough before you have a path that's carved out, right? It's the yeah. same thing. So you do it enough times, it becomes enough. Mm -hmm. Where you all of a sudden, somebody triggers you very, very, you know, suddenly and you, you're not in a position to do that. You can just go and you just let it go. You can also do this in your head. You understand when you're tapping, pay attention to what that feels like against your fingertips and against your skin on the face. So then you can do that in your head. You understand? You can recreate the sensations in your mind. If you're, you know, at work and you don't want to look silly or whatever, you can do that and it will still work. Mm -hmm. And then just in the end, just go grab your wrist. Okay, and I'm good. So basically, eventually, you're implanting the trigger with whether it's here, the internal feeling of tapping, or when you hold your wrist. Yeah, this becomes the anchor where now this movement and this, you know, squeezing of the wrist is associated with imprinting with, of a positive feeling and the feeling of peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, guys. Last chance, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, okay, so we are going to wrap it up soon. Ivana, so I just want to ask you again, the same thing as I ask every time, because there might be that some viewers will watch this particular webinar as, as their first one. So in case anyone is interested in a personal consultation with you, what, what kind of issues are you working with and uh, what kind of, issues uh, can they address in, in personal meetings with you? Mm -hmm. So I am a detox coach. I help people detox. I, uh, I am a fasting coach, someone who does extended dry fasting. Uh, I do iridology readings where I look at a person's iris and I can tell you what genetic weaknesses you have, what level of lymphatic stagnation you have, if you're, if you're headed for any troubles. And based on that information, I can devise a protocol for you, herbal protocol and diet to help you uh, to feeling good and healthy. And then I also work with people and their emotions in various ways. I also do energy work because I'm a channel and an energy healer. So we can do energy healing, we can do tapping. I, I employ other techniques such as VLO, which is um, an energy technique uh, of mobilization of energies. I, I help people to develop their psychic abilities, how to sense energies. I help uh, and coach people on how to leave their body and have out-of-body experiences. I am uh, a coach for the law of attraction and manifestation. So I do a lot of different things. I, I like a well-rounded approach to a person. So it's not just physical, but you know, we address physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the, the person. Mm, that's amazing. And once you even mentioned to me that you can work with people 
distantly, like even uh, absolutely. Yeah? The energy is is non-local. Energy does not know boundaries of space and time. Everything is here now. And it's the intention that directs the energy and the energy follows intention. You just thinking about somebody who could be on the moon. It doesn't matter. They could be dead or alive. You're making energetic contact with that person instantly. Mm -hmm. So, so if, uh, absolutely, you can work with anybody anywhere. Yeah, so if anyone is interested in helping their, let's say, sick relative or something like that, mm -hmm. and, and this relative cannot get in touch with you but you can still help this person right absolutely and does it require the knowledge of that particular person who is sick that you are helping well, them we usually it's ethical to ask permission mm -hmm. instead of just but sometimes people can be in a state where they're in a coma they can't give right. you consent right. right right so we just assume that they want help anyway mm. right as long as our intention is clear and yeah, we're not yeah. doing this out of uh, egotistical reasons mm -hmm. or self-serving reasons. Yeah. And the way I do it, most of the times, I don't use my energy. I channel energy because mm. my energy is tainted. You understand? I have thoughts, feelings, emotions. But what I do, I go into a semi-conscious trance. I connect with a source of energy. Usually I work with Archangel Michael or other healing guides. And what they do, they channel energy through me. And when the energy comes through the physical body, through a channel, it becomes grounded where it now can impact the recipient on a more physical level. Okay. So, yeah. but it, it's not my energy that goes out to them. I am simply a vessel through which it, I'm like a faucet through which you run water. You understand? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So my job is to be an open receptor and have a clear focus in mind where the energy is going but the guides are the ones doing the work and they're bringing in really high quality energy, much better and higher quality of energy than my own and much okay. more potent energy. Okay, very interesting, very inspiring. Okay, guys, so we are going to wrap it up. Below the video, you will find Ivana's contact details. Also, my contact details. Uh, my name is Arik and I'm the facilitator of the weekly fasting group. If the idea of fasting for between 24 and 36 hours every week appeals to you. You are welcome to join our international WhatsApp group. We have, we have uh, more than 200 members as for now from all over the world. And also maybe Ivana, you can uh, send me the um, link to the YouTube channel of this guy who developed this shortened EFT technique so that people can, yes. Yes. can um, get this information directly from the person yes. who, who developed it okay thank you very much guys thank you very much to all the participants thank you very much ivana for this enlightening and life-changing webinar you're uh, all very welcome it's been a pleasure guys yeah okay guys thank you very much bye bye everyone love and light bye. everyone bye bye bye, bye.